Hello and welcome to the Educational Forum presented by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover and the American College of History and Legal Studies in Salem, New Hampshire. My name is Kurt Olson and I'm a professor at the Massachusetts School of Law. Today's program is First Voices Indigenous Radio. Teokasin Ghost Horse, a member of the Lakota tribe from South Dakota, hosts a weekly radio program in New York City called First Voices Indigenous Radio. I first met him in Plymouth, Massachusetts during last year's National Day of Mourning, also known to Euro-Americans as Thanksgiving Day. Tio Kassin spoke briefly from a trailer on Coles Hill that day. He spoke about Native Americans' connection to the struggles of indigenous people everywhere, and he ended his presentation with a fist pump and a rousing hokahe. I was immediately struck by Tio Kassin's nobility of spirit and imposing presence. Meeting Tio Kassin brought to mind the Indians who occupied Wounded Knee in 1973 during the anniversary of the massacre there in the 1890s. These Indians, part of the American Indian Movement, or AIM, fought for rights for Indians and sought to reinvigorate the movement to restore the traditional culture of language, music, religion, and spirituality, which had been ripped from Indian tribes everywhere as part of the white man's efforts to deny Indians their birthright. During today's program, Tio Kassin and I seek to inform our audience about Native American issues and how those issues affect indigenous peoples everywhere. Welcome, Tio Kassin. Hoka hey. Hoka hey. That, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Kurt, for inviting me to this uh, program, Edu Educational Forum. Educational Forum, correct. And uh, yeah. I just want to say, you know, to all the listeners out there, you may hear something that you disagree with, but, you know, it, uh, sometimes it has to be that way. I'm right. not trying to offend anybody, but also, hoka hey means let's have some action. Mm -hmm. That's what okay. it really means. Let's get going. Right. So you're actually trying to motivate people to, to do something. And I guess yeah. that sort of leads into to the first uh, question that's a part of my introduction. You're a radio host of a, of a radio program in New York City, and yet you hail from South Dakota originally. Can you tell me something about the process? What brought you there? Well, the process is a long process, of course, but it began when I was a childhood. I won't go through that. But mm -hmm. I'll go through where I used to work with the state legislature of Washington. Um, uh, in the, the uh, data information services there for, for the state senate and, and the house chambers and whatnot. And uh, being a computer programmer um, and just basically following orders to get data out so somebody else could speak about it, it left me as a native person wondering why my voice or as an indigenous person, Native American, um, was not being heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, you know, I have to go back and try to get a voice for these people go back to school actually and, mm -hmm. and so I did I, I stopped going to work okay and I protested in a way that most people weren't they they were they had their security their financial security and whatnot and that was their security I walked off the job because I could not handle not being me anymore mm -hmm. I'm not an order taker right and first first of all so I had to go and I said I'm going back to school to relearn about things that I knew about I had to have a piece of paper to understand to say that I knew about being a native person, right? Mm -hmm, right. So I went back to get the piece of paper. Now, I understand from uh, from conversations that we've had that that you you also um, you were I guess ripped out of your own background yes. in terms of you were on the reservation I assume mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when you were a young child and you were taken away to a boarding school and that's fairly typical of people of your generation, correct? It's, it's typical. Most people thought this happened in the early first half of the 19th century, right? Or excuse mm -hmm. me, 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it happened up until in 1988 and continues in more of a legal way with the Indian Child Welfare Act where a lot of native children are adopted, fostered out, fostered out, or just plain taken away mm -hmm. from the parents because of economic, the economic plight of most native people in the West where I'm from mm -hmm. in South Dakota. Whereas we are non-casino tribes in a sense that we we, uh, we, we are held under the stigma that we are rich as native people because native people have tribes, I mean, have casinos, but mm -hmm. we, we as one are the poorest people in the Western Hemisphere behind the people of Haiti only. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a young child, part of the government policy was to take the children away to teach them, acculturate them into another uh, society of America. Basically the motto was, and still stands somewhat in my mind that to kill the Indian and save the man is the policy so that we don't retain culture, we don't speak our language, mm -hmm. we don't think differently than what Americans are taught, mm -hmm. um, mainly by their educational methods 
And also a disconnection to the land. I think that's the main theory, main theme about why natives become American is that, that well, we will leave the land so the rest of America can be had mm -hmm. as private property. Right. Um, I know that, uh, I, th I think it was Red Cloud, who was a, a chief, I'm not sure of your tribe or not, but Red Cloud who said that the, the white man has made us many promises uh, and only one has he kept, and that is he promised that he would take our land mm -hmm. and he took our land. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that continued. I mean, that was part of the reason for the uh, American Indian movement gaining strength in the 70s, right? Yeah. It was because even though they had said, okay, this is your reservation, this is where you can stay, yeah. they recognized there are a lot of minerals and various other you know, valuable things mm -hmm. on the land. So we're going to take more. I mean, yeah, yeah. In, in that time of the 50s and 60s, when the the multinational, in that case, international um, ex extraction corporations were coming onto land and doing explore exploration, mm -hmm. exploratory drilling holes, and they discovered uranium and oil and gold and coal and all the precious minerals and, and reserves of, of energy mm -hmm. uh, that are on that. America's worst lands that we were driven to or relocated to. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it was more than just that. It was the, uh, of course, we attacked the culture first. We, we, we tell the kids that they don't, it's not good to be a native or an Indian. Mm -hmm. So that's drilled into the people. Then we become welfare state people that we, we look to the handouts of America and the good people of America to help us along. And then we lose face because we weren't beggars in the first place or thieves. Mm -hmm. It goes against our philosophies of life to be that. Um, we always shared. We were fiercely self-sufficient uh, as people. Um, we didn't have concepts, of course. But so I think what happened with the U.S. government is to come and take that land away from Native people, um, but not give them give the rest of America the true knowledge of why they were doing. Uh, those forced relocations mm -hmm. uh, because of the land. Right, okay. Well, not so much the land, really, as what was under the land. Yes. Right? And I yes. think you, you mentioned earlier, the, or, or within that last answer, something about the, the worst lands of America. Mm -hmm. Well, to the average white person, I guess, or as I've described them, Euro-American, they might look at the Black Hills of South Dakota mm -hmm. and see nothing but wasteland. Right. Or see a reservation where there are poor people, as you said, the welfare state. Mm -hmm. Right? Whereas you view that as, as, as sacred land, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and part of the reason for your outrage at the United States government coming in and wanting to take more of it is that those are your holy places is that right yeah the, ho the whole earth is is holy to us as native people mm -hmm. and in the 60s again if you add uh, the fact that we had no f religion or freedom of religion we could not vote um, you know we we the any resources that we had were inadequate and so it was either a blessing in disguise that some of us did retain culture as Lakota people mm -hmm. um, to not have running water or to you know, have any services that the rest of this country did have. I think most of us at that time were choosing not to because we see and we have seen what it has done to the, the soul or spirit of the land and the people mm -hmm. as we understood that um, we have a term for the type of behavior that describes described as greed is called washichu. Mm -hmm. Washichu meaning, and it could be anybody, not just a certain race, right. but it means it takes too much or takes the fat. So we wanted to avoid that. Even today, there are people not wanting to be an American because, you know, when I go home, I'm teaching about the etymology of what these words like America mean in, in Latin form and romance feminine form. Ame means the love of, rica means riches. Mm -hmm. And when you become an American, you become one who loves riches. So it's very um, dichotomous to native, which is mm -hmm. non-material as to material. So you have these two philosophies in, in clash, in mm -hmm. a sense. Right, and that resulted in, uh, again, the uh, I guess the, the second massacre at, at Wounded Knee, essentially, when, I mean, the, the first massacre would have been in the 1890s when women and children were killed by the American cavalry mm -hmm. um, because the, the, the men had gone away to, to still continue to fight. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the, the, the Indians at that point, Native Americans, bring it forward in, in 1973? In other words, how, how did Hoka Hay uh, t take, take strength from, from what happened in 1973? I think um, having enough um, suppression, all the shuns like depression and mm -hmm. repress, well, all, all of those. Um, American Indian Movement, as far as I know the history of it, was started in the urban cities of Minneapolis where a lot of native men, women, and children were being found on the streets and being beat up. And you know, although there was a black movement going on, the native person was left out of 
the picture, mm -hmm. you know. And so the government, using the policy of out of sight, out of mind, basically applied that to Native people and did not bring into light for the rest of America, who really believed, as the rest of the world believed at the time, that all the Native people were killed off. So mm -hmm. there was really no Native people left. You didn't live in teepees, so there's no more Indians. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But yet, that remained strong, and that especially that north central part of this country. Um, and so they, they came out of the cities and the barrios and the, the ghettos and saying that we can't be treated like this anymore. It's our turn to stand up. And so that's when they gathered. They, they had um, Western educated native people like myself, mm -hmm. but also people who were trying to go back and find their heritage and, and, and culture. Mm -hmm. And then there was those of us on the reservation who had our culture and language who joined forces with the educated people, and then out of that came uh, the, this, the, the new native type, a native person who was, you know, a prototype basically who could include Western reasoning and, and educational processes along with the the old way of doing things as native people, mm -hmm. and combine that, and and that's where the American Indian Movement came out. There's so much I want to talk about. Can we make this a three-hour show? No. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to the second hour, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so some, something that uh, my 12-year-old my daughter asked me yes. when I described some of these issues um, w it was, uh, how is it that, you know, I think you talked about, you know, the theft of your land. You talked about how uh, you were indoctrinated and your language was taken away from you and your religion and your spirituality and all of those things were taken away from the white man's culture. Uh, what her response was, well, how can that happen? Mm -hmm. What about the Constitution? Mm -hmm. I mean, how is it that, I mean, obviously we're in a law school setting here, so the, the Constitution is important. Why is it, do you think, that the Constitution doesn't apply to Native Americans? I think <coughs> because um, and originally um, the, the, the truth is that the Constitution does come from the Iroquois Confederacy. It does come, and the U.S. Congress acknowledged that not long ago, mm -hmm. that it does indeed influence by the, the and you find out uh, Franklin and Jefferson did go mm -hmm. and spend at least 30 years before and learned the, the, the Mohawk jargon, the Mohegan jargon, all the Iroquois jargon of trade and learned and sat with their councils and, and studied and like, wow, these people had equality, men and women. Mm -hmm. And they said, how can, and at that time there were f a few million, it wasn't just a hundred thousand or so, there were millions of native people across this land that lived the same way, the same principles. So it was not just the Iroquois, mm -hmm. but the institution, Constitution was in this part in Philadelphia in, in the Northeast, so mm -hmm. so that's where they talk about. In fact, Jake Swamp and Tom Porter, who are traditional chiefs this day of the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, um, have those stories that are not written into history books. They may be referenced, mm -hmm. but when the Iroquois chiefs were asked to come to the Freedom Hall, Independence Hall mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, they were put upstairs. Hmm. And whenever the, the, the Continental Congress had deliberations, they would go upstairs and ask the Native people, what did you do when you got to this part? Hmm. And the thing that we don't hear is that these chiefs were locked into the upstairs. They were only brought food and, and questions. And we don't hear the other part of, you know, how the, the founding fathers actually excluded the Native people. Well, that's a mindset mm -hmm. because this country needed an enemy. Mm -hmm. And the women and children, well, they were property of the rich white males, and they couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. And the black man was property also, so they mm -hmm. couldn't vote. Women belonged, uh, poor white people belonged as serfs or serfdom in that, in that thinking of it. Mm -hmm. And they were property, they couldn't vote, they didn't have power. Okay. But then you had millions upon millions of native people. Let's not let them vote. Let's not let them vote, because that means they're gonna be power here. So mm -hmm. from that time, we were mentioned as far as governing being governed by commerce and that the United States did have say in what they traded with other countries and what not. And that's and in the Constitution. And with the Indian tribes, yes. right. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. they, they mentioned Indian nations within. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. And today that's still true. But as far as giving us freedom of religion, um, communal property, which we were used to sharing, that did not fit privatization and ownership and monarchy especially. Mm -hmm. Because as you see, this country still adores the king and queen of England. Mm -hmm. Yet it's a country that's not supposed to be uh, on upon those principles where everybody is inalienable and is treated equally. Well, mm -hmm. it's not true with Native peoples even today. Uh -huh. um, it, it's it's uh, when, when you are an evidence, living evidence of that constitution and the crimes committed against Native people such as myself and knowing that, mm 
mm -hmm. and be being able to understand inequalities, well, that's not going to be listened to because that's the enemy talking to mm -hmm. them. So for, for your 12-year-old, mm -hmm. I say, you know, look at what you're reaping as an American. And you really think in its ownership terms, you think about all Americans, any American, foreigners who come here want a piece of the American pie. Metaphorically, I say, you want a piece of the American pie, just don't forget who owns the bakery. In, in terms of who owns the bakery and how these stories are, are, are told going forward, um, one of the things I studied in college was, uh, was Greek and, and Latin languages and uh, this whole notion of the oral tradition. And I know that the, some, the, the oral tradition is, is, you've already mentioned the Iroquois chiefs, right, mm -hmm. who, who maintain the stories about how we, get, we got a lot of the Constitution from the Iroquois con Confederacy. Mm -hmm. how, how does that oral tradition work even now? And, and could you describe something about how uh, those stories come down to us through time? That it, it doesn't work very well nowadays because it, in a sense they're in, in my nation, the Lakota, the Sioux, mm -hmm. um, th there is a, um, a f an old language, old Lakota, and then there's a new Lakota. The new Lakota tends to objectify a lot more. In other words, there's an ownership or possession of things. So that breaks down a relational uh, sense of being with the younger children. They see what they want on TV, and that's what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. Instead of sharing what they see on TV, that belongs to them in individuality. Mm -hmm. So when you break down Originally, the I and me that did not exist in Lakota, the words for it. Right. Um, I'm sorry, let, let me uh, yeah. re repeat that if you yeah. would. I and me, so the yes. whole notion of possession or myself it mm -hmm. has no meaning for, for Lakota people, correct? It, 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 it does now, right. but okay. back then, yeah. you know, the I and me was, was just non-existent. We didn't have the word, mm -hmm. the old Lakota. The new Lakota referenced I and me first and foremost. So mm -hmm. when we're speaking English, that's what we plan we tend to do is I and me, okay. um, and possessive in that sense. Okay. So, so there are really two different branches of the Lakota language at this, this point, though the, the, the branch that has been, uh, I guess, infected by yes. various English concepts and the one that yes. still maintains yes. the traditional yes. heritage? Yes, yes. And, and, and I know this may offend some people, but there, there is some time um, in the 1800s when, because of our prophecies, um, and our prophecies are basically 2,500 years before we even had the inkling of what, what a white man was, in that sense, um, that we prophesied that these things would happen to us, and at that time we would have to bring out the sacred language. Now, a sacred language is meant that you and I, as, as native people, if, if that would be, we taught mm -hmm. common, mm -hmm. but when we saw the enemy coming, we had to have sort of a code between us to protect us. So when we were captured or whatnot, in that sense, mm -hmm. that we would use this code language. Well, that was sort of a, a sacred thing to us. We had, as commoners, in a sense, had to use sacred language to protect our spirit so that remains intact. Mm -hmm. And the irony it is, of it is, Kurt, is that we use that, that seed, that heritage of being sacred as human beings so that we can help the enemy who is trying to take from us. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, doing this radio uh, this TV program, right. not radio, <laughs> this TV <Close> program <laughs> is that we are actually helping those who would see because we knew that, we know that we are people of earth and that someday we would have to come together. And, and Crazy Horse said that when, uh, when there will come a time when I look into your eyes and I see the center of the universe and when you're at that place within you, I too will be at that place and there will be peace between our peoples. That's paraphrasing what Crazy Horse said. Right. And mm -hmm. that time is now because of what is happening to Earth, our mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? And right. so in that, that way, we recognize uh, beyond history, beyond, beyond labels and cultures and religions, that our energy as you and I, as beings, is the same. Mm -hmm. And that's the message that we're trying to pass along because that spirit cannot be controlled by those same religions or politics or, you know, economics or whatever. That cannot be. Because we all go to the same place that when it's done, finished, right? Right. So. You, you gave me a certain uh, a posture, a, oh, a, a picture yeah. of yourself looking like this. Yes. Uh, and I think that's uh, tied into to what you just said about how, <coughs> the, the, well, actually Lakota, and you mentioned the term Sioux, mm -hmm. which 
you seem to, to bristle at. You take a little bit of offense at the term well, I, soup. I bristle at everything. Okay, good. That's, so. what, that's, that's so, what I'm yeah, looking no. forward to. But let's <laughs> hoke a hay. <laughs> 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 so uh, why is it that, that there is that distinction between, on the one hand, the Lakota who are trying to reach out to their enemies and show them that we are all part of the same mm -hmm. th essential, I guess, force, mm -hmm. right? And uh, at the same time, there is th this feeling that, well, you know, uh, we don't like the term Sue, that's yeah. a label that you, yeah. you on the outside have applied yeah. to us. Yeah, yeah. Sue, Sue is a, a, a derivative of a language of Nadewa Sue, which recognized that it really meant Nadewa Sue in an Ojibwa language, and as far as I know, meant the, the, the ones hard to find in the grass, because in the prairie they were tall grass, six foot tall grass, and, and then we were hard to find. Mm -hmm. And um, when you take part of that Nadewa Sue, not Nadea off, there's Sioux, mm -hmm. and that essentially meant enemy. And so when the French came down a river, they couldn't repeat what the Chippewa were saying, so Ojibwa, mm -hmm. and right. so that's where Chippewa comes from, by the way. Okay. Just like Cherokee comes from Chalagi. Uh. So they, because Jefferson could not say Chalagi, uh -huh. he said Cherokee. Cherokee. That's what he heard. But okay. anyway, mm -hmm. so when they came down a the river, they could not say Nadewa Sioux, but they heard Sioux. Mm -hmm. So they start using it, and that's when the government said, oh, we're going to use Sioux because it means enemy, and we have to make them an en enemy, as, as I presented before. Mm -hmm. Millions right. of Native people, they can't vote. Let's make them the enemy. Right. And so that, and Lakota merely means peaceful ones. People come together and make friends with everybody, all life, not just humans. Okay. That's so even though you say that you bristle at everything, the truth is that you yeah. would reach out to your enemies and show them that yes. there, there is a better way for us all to live together. In, in a sense, yeah, yeah. this means um, what is above is also below. It's also signifying that um, we, we have, our thought process comes from our heart uh, as this nasula that would be called brain in, in, in English. Um, we don't have the, that concept of a brain but it is th the thought process which creates and so we know that creation comes from the thought process this is part of this means merely means seed of the heart nasula means seed of the heart so all of our process comes from the center as as all indigenous peoples around the world have even your your people in the original sense of uh, being indigenous mm -hmm. come from that mm -hmm. Uh, actually, that would probably would bring us back to the audience. You say that you may, may have offended people before yeah. by something you might have said, but yeah. a, a, as you've pointed out, uh, indigenous peoples have exist all over the world. And part of the, the reason for your radio show is, is to reach out to whether it's the, I think you said Maori in, in, Maori. New, Ze Maori yeah. Maori. in New Zealand or the, uh, the, the indigenous peoples in, in Australia. Or, uh, but I think you also pointed out that in Europe, there, there are, are, are many indigenous people, all of whom are threatened by extinction, yep. correct? Exactly. Yeah. About 71 different uh, uh, European tribes, I guess you would say, in that sense, European peoples um, who are losing their language just as fast as anybody else in the world as indigenous. Mm -hmm. There are approximately 350 million indigenous peoples um, out of, what, almost 8 billion people. All of those peoples are indigenous, live on 71% of the land that's still pristine in the world and that has clean water and clean air and clean land while well that is being taken away now with the onslaught of so-called civilizations and civilizations higher thinking form mm -hmm. right evolved right. but I if it's to kill earth that's not higher thinking so you have indigenous peoples who are living the highest form of intelligence by taking care of the land and not cutting it down to make books to read about what they cut down what they recently cut yeah. down Interestingly, um, I think that dichotomy that you mentioned before is, is key and, and probably is one of the most important things that you could explain on, on the show today, and that is you know, the relational, uh, as you explain the, the Lakota way, uh, as compared to the, the modern, uh, I guess you'd call it, quote unquote, um, civilized yeah. way of thinking, right, which is rational. Yeah. And, and there must be an end point, a beginning point, and all yeah. of those things, whereas yeah. yours is more of a circle. Is that yeah. a, a yeah. way to describe it? It's, 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 I say this without trying to be comparative, but mm -hmm. because I'm speaking a language, I have to say, oh, this versus whatever. Right. So yeah. when I come and I speak Lakota, I'm looking at the whole picture, a circle with data with comes from any place, arbitrarily within that circle. That's my information base and data bank. Mm -hmm. And when I speak English, I'm, I'm basically speaking about a 
a rectangle on its one end to the other, top and the bottom, beginning and ending, and all the data is nice, neat rows, information, so you have to re memorize it. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't fit a quantum physics thinking relational view into that, that rational, because that mm -hmm. ration all, mm -hmm. basically, I think. Uh, in my simplest terms, mm -hmm. but you you have that, and you can you can take the the big circle and shrink it down and put it at the bottom of that little strip, but you still don't have the whole view because that little strip is under control, mm -hmm. and free being free means that you can with the big circle take the rational thinking process and put it within that circle and be inclusive, because the other one is exclusive. Mm -hmm. It talks about chosen people, elite, special. We can't have that in Lakota mm -hmm. when everything is equal to who and what you are. That's, that's how you, re you, uh, you look at life. That's how Einstein looked at it. E equals MC squared. Everything mm -hmm. is relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. And it seems very um, sort of childish in that rational way of thinking, oh, that's some new agey stuff that really doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. scientists really are now looking to that native science in, in a sense and trying to include it somehow, but now they have to reach outside, and I say reach outside of the box, which is an old cliche, but I also say we have to start thinking outside of the bomb. I think you uh, ha have recently visited with um, people at Columbia University yes. School of Medicine yes. um, to talk to them about e exactly that kind of thing, that there are different ways of looking at medicine, look different way of looking at, uh, at healing. Yes. Uh, yes. Are, are all of those things tied together? Is, is it holistic medicine that you're talking about, or is it something that well, the, more the that they needed to know? The head of neurology, <laughs> the brain surgeons, yeah. um, all these people are interested in this stuff because they, they realize maybe before they did they had some inkling of it mm -hmm. but I think now there's a whole world opening up where they realize that energy has to do with everything mm -hmm. and that cannot be controlled or can be understood it's the mystery but it's how you use the energy because as human humans on this side of the planet we are we have tended not to use energy properly we use too much of of it mm -hmm. so it's depleting other parts of the world like water is energy like you know, pollution is energy that's that's gone astray, mm -hmm. right? We we don't we use it improperly, and that's what they're looking at in a, to make things in a, in a positive light is to use energy in a proper way. That's that's simple. Mm -hmm. now, I, one of the interesting things that I've gotten from from reading, uh, doing a little background reading in preparation for this show, is um, something that Linda Hogan says in her book, mm -hmm. and I think that y you probably would agree with this, but obviously I don't want to put words in your mouth. When um, Native, uh, sorry, when European Americans visit um, a, a place like Lakota land in, in, in South Dakota or elsewhere, they become enchanted. And even though originally going there, they think, well, this is all just child's play or whatever, and it's not, it's not really good thinking. They have a hard time leaving once they're there. Is that part of the reason why they suddenly they, they realize, well, this is actually a better way of thinking? Well, <coughs> again, I'll go back to where we, we don't have the word for better mm -hmm. because that's on a degree of better or worse, right? Because right. um, yeah. it merely means that we're not satisfied when you have better or a new way. Mm -hmm. But if you learn how to live well, and if they, they run into a, a, a culture like uh, Lakota culture with the pockets that, are still, that still remain, you understand a philosophy that's really different. It's not better or worse, but it's different from the way the rote philosophy that we've been given material philosophy, what makes you successful, and what makes you intelligent. Mm -hmm. Well, it's totally opposite. It's more of a spiritual, more an energy that they feel, and that in this, this society, that's missed because religion contains and controls it. So when you, as a non-native, would come to Lakota country, you, you tend not to understand through the head in those uh, thought process, but more of an intuitive value that we all feel as children. Excellent. We'll finish this up uh, after the break. Thanks very much. Right. Tio Kassim. Awesome. At the New American College of History and Legal Study in Salem, New Hampshire, you can finish your bachelor's degree affordably and get on the fast track to law school. We teach American history and you'll receive a rigorous education at a very low cost. The small day and evening classes allow you to interact closely with the distinguished faculty. At the American College of History and Legal Studies, professors don't lecture. Through the discussion method of teaching, you'll be engaged in the issues raised in class. 
You'll learn to be a critical thinker, a better writer, and a polished public speaker. And you'll be able to compete with anybody in today's competitive marketplace. You can also get on the fast track to law school. Qualified students gain early admission into the Massachusetts School of Law. The new American College of History and Legal Studies offers the junior and senior years of undergraduate education. To finish your bachelor's degree, with the opportunity to start your law degree early, call or visit today. Massachusetts School of Law. Legal education that is practical, accessible, affordable, and enjoyable. Offering flexible day and evening classes, full or part-time studies, where candidates are assessed not on the LSAT, but their academic and other accomplishments. Providing more professional skills training than any other law school in New England. Massachusetts School of Law. Visit us at mslaw.edu. Training students to become successful lawyers and advocates, not just legal scholars. Can you tell which of these children was not born free? Can you tell which of these children was not born equal? Can you tell which of these children does not deserve to be treated with dignity? We can't either. Human right number one. We are all born free and equal. Welcome back to MSL's Educational Forum. Today we're discussing uh, Indigenous Voices, uh, the radio show broadcast from New York City on a weekly basis and also heard around the world at various affiliates. Uh, Tio Kassin, uh, before the break we were talking about how the thought processes differ depending on whether you're Euro-American or a Lakota. And you were talking about how uh, children uh, in our culture are in, infected in certain ways by the denial and, and various other things. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, you know, when, when you asked me earlier about the U.S. Constitution and um, I, in my younger days when I was more forthright and, um, well, excuse me, more protesting things, you know, mm -hmm. more like, you know, you're right and I'm wrong, uh -huh. um, without knowing much, uh, maybe I don't yet, but when people say, well, I wasn't there, I didn't kill your grandmother, I didn't do this, and I, you know, don't, don't blame me for it, for you not having what you should have like we do. Mm -hmm. and I, thought, I thought upon that, and I said, I said, wait, now, you follow the U.S. Constitution, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, well, who doesn't? I'm a citizen, and I follow the U.S. Constitution. And so I'm saying, well, that was in 1776, was it not? And, and they say, yes, it was. And I says, well, I wasn't there. I didn't sign the Constitution, so why should I follow your laws? And so that's the same reasoning I'm saying is, is if someone walks up to me and says, my Lakota flute is just like their recorder, I'll say, no, your recorder is just like my, my flute, to put it in their shoes, basically, right. because then it, it brings it to a playing a level, you know, like, look, we're the same. Mm -hmm. We right. may be different only in color, but we're the same. So when you think of me, of you as a better people or race or civilization, look how inferior that thinking is. Mm. And leads uh, eventually to destructiveness around the world, right? Yeah. I mean, we've already talked about how indigenous cultures throughout Europe, I think you mentioned the, the number of indigenous yeah. cultures that I'm sure many people aren't aware of. Yeah. But then uh, around the world, the conflict between multinational corporations and their desire to gobble up everything. Mm -hmm. And the, as you said, the, the, I think it's 71% of mm -hmm. the remaining untouched land pretty much controlled by indigenous peoples. Yeah. How can we prevent what seems like a, an endless stream of, of progress to gobble up all those things? Well, let's, let's define the word progress. To me, it merely means uh, making complicated what is already simple. And I think we tend to be too full of ourselves as far as what intelligence is. And we tend to, because we, we don't have the happiness that those indigenous peoples have, but we tend to view our happiness as what we own and how much put in possession we have in our garage or whatnot, mm -hmm. in our bank account. Mm -hmm. So we tend to make all our judgments through the bank, our decisions through the bank, rather than what those indigenous peoples are making their decisions, decisions, through, decisions through is Mother Earth. And treating Mother like she is a live being 
and yet we know as all of us living now we feel indigenous but we have forgotten how mm -hmm. and so those indigenous peoples have not and as americans and i see this and i can spread this around and say it's a general statement too mm -hmm. but americans don't want to admit they're wrong because that means they're they're lower than mm -hmm. americans um also don't want to admit that they are unhappy because it's the pride within coming from a, a maybe a peoples in Europe before that had all that taken away from them. Mm -hmm. So they came here to own property, to have this, that saying that you're outstanding. And then the religions dictate that the more you own, the, the more nicer things you have, then you must be a better person. And besides, God's going to look at you and give you these things. And then you're going to go to a place up there with pearly gates and streets paved with goals now what 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 nights what what thinking native person would want to go to some place that has pearly gates and streets paved with gold not one native person mm -hmm. who knows themselves would ever want to go there where do they go instead i mean as, as what, what is, is the basis of, of the spirituality as, as a about? lakota we have no need for a heaven we no have no need for a hell it's right here we're not worried about not going to heaven we're not worried about going to hell. We are right here. We are conscious. There is no present. I mean, excuse me. There's no past. There is no future. It's all right here, right now. We are both of those, right now. So that we we evolved into this state of consciousness that says, "I am you. You are me. My body is in the soul. You are my soul. I must respect you." Instead of my soul is only in my body, separate. So I must gather in order to feel like I, I own or I am somebody because it's about individuality. Now, un understand, of course, Tio Kassin, as I'm sure you do, that, that many people in our culture would say, well, what's wrong with the pearly gates and the streets paved with gold? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's what we've been searching for our, our whole lives, and you know, is, yeah. is to make more yes. all the time. Yes, and, and yeah. that, that's their story. Mm -hmm. our, ours is that maybe we don't need, maybe we just, uh, we, we turn into a tree. Maybe we turn into one of them. Maybe we turn into something. But energy is exchanged. We just don't die. Our spirit, our energy just goes back to earth. And that's a good thing, too. Mm -hmm. But it's also that you live in, in the Lakota philosophy. We were alive before we came here. We're alive now, and we'll be alive, even though physically we may change. Mm -hmm. Because all of our uh, reality in, in this way of thinking and in, in, in rational thinking is, is contained within our physicality. We only understand our five senses and try to interpret what spirit is through religion and politics and rational thinking. So we're, we're coming from a lack of mentality already. So we complain about everything. We complain about somebody who may know the answer as compared to somebody who is living the answer. We don't have words like believe, which is so easily used in this society, because believe to us, I if you think about it, it's a spiritual lazy word mm -hmm. because that because that book says somebody somebody else's experience is not your experience. That's believable. No, you have to know your experience says that you know this, and that's what becomes you become wise because in in Lakota we had the saying in order to protect ourselves, and it's, it goes like this: that be careful of the education that they they bring to you and force upon you, because that education may may educate the wisdom out of your soul. Hmm. Interestingly, I'd, I'd hate to do this full circle thing, but obviously we'll, we'll talk about a lot yeah. of issues yeah. today yeah. And, and go for another couple of days. Um, but a, as for today, when it comes to you know the, the holidays that are coming up, I know that those are of great importance to you. And in fact, the radio show, I think you've said, will be, what, four hours long on mm -hmm. Columbus Day and then for a full day yeah. on, uh, on Thanksgiving Day. I, uh, one of the books that I read uh, by, I think it was Francis Jennings, it talks about, actually the title is The Invasion of America. Mm -hmm. And obviously that would be, I think, a Lakota worldview. That that's what happened when the Euro-Americans came here in their ships. Yeah. Whereas our view, and the one that we have been taught up until very recently in, in elementary schools, is it was the discovery of America. Mm -hmm. Columbus discovered America mm -hmm. and brought you know, forth all the riches that uh, Europeans could lavish upon this poor, poor land. Right. Mm -hmm. how, how, how are those two different and why do you view it as the invasion of America? Well, it was the first world war to us. It was the first time we had contact and um, they had money in their eyes or that value of, that was new to us because mm -hmm. we gave all the time. Our number one uh, value is, 
is generosity. And so they came and they took advantage of that generosity with greed. Mm -hmm. And when you come from a land that's divided up among kingdoms and serfdoms and whatnot, and you don't have, you're going to always want. And that's what it is. And in our culture, we don't have the word for want. So we don't need it. If right. you're in a sharing culture, you don't have the word for want. Mm -hmm. You always like, what can I give? So, and not rather than what I can have or take. Mm -hmm. So that's, you say you, 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 we don't need a word for, for ownership. So, so when Columbus discovered, we actually had the view from the shore mm -hmm. that they came here and we saw them and we saw that they were poor of spirit. Mm -hmm. We helped. And this is the, the stories of Taino who are still alive, the Arawak who are still alive, that the history books say are dead and gone. Mm -hmm. These people are speaking Taino in New York City. And, and they may be multiracial, but they are still speaking that language and their stories are passed on. So when, when the onslaught of discovery came to us, people forget that Europe's renaissance was based on the resources and the gold they took from here. And so when you have a people who are lacking in kingdom and serfdoms, and now all of a sudden they have, they're going to hold that above everybody else to say, look, we're not poor anymore. We're somebody now because we have material just like that king who ruled us. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the dominant, the domination, dominate, which is a, a Latin word which comes, it, it really describes domo. Domo means, has seven meanings, and that's where freedom comes from. So we don't say freedom, we say free. So when we're thinking about Columbus and a mentality, it's like a virus. Mm -hmm. And we have to protect ourselves from thinking and being with the virus mm -hmm. by ownership, by war, which we don't have in our language. Now, all the, the stories that are made up about Indians only started when Columbus got here. And he supposedly named us Indians, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But the history of Indians only started with the history of this country. Because before that, no one wants to talk about that we are older than America. And there was another way of thinking here that still lies here and still here. Mm -hmm. And, and people don't want to talk about that because it's a new and better way, which for us as Native people, as evidenced, we are not in a better way, mm -hmm. a better state. We, we are in actually, if we compare it, in a worse state. But spiritually, we are in a, better, in, a, in a strong state because we are resilient. We aren't resistant to what they are calling themselves as the power because it's ruled by greed and war. It's a very much thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think what, what enters into this discussion a lot from the si standpoint of, of Euro-Americans is mm -hmm. that, hey, well, what about progress? I mean, it, haven't, haven't we done so much to this country that we know was never even possible before <laughs> wh when, the, when the Indians, you know, Good ruled, the, yes. <laughs> ruled the 50 states? You yes. know, I mean, now we have paved roads and we have huge and impressive buildings <laughs> and we have statues and we have all of the things that make life good. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the roads, to, uh, millions of, uh, the biggest oil spill in the world happened in America. It's on roads and pavements and everything. That's the biggest oil spill. Look what it's doing to the land. People think because it's in inanimate and it's not moving anywhere mm -hmm. that those so-called dinosaurs aren't going to, you know, get back at us. Mm -hmm. Well, look what's happening. The land's getting worse. My, in my time, coming from having no running water, clean water, mm -hmm. having... No just electricity. Not running. <laughs> yeah, just not running. Uh, right. You know, uh, having clean water, having clean air, having clean gardens that long before it was organic, growing up in a clean way and, and giving thanks for everything all the time mm -hmm. to being saying, well, you can't live that way. You have to live in cluster housing and we'll provide running water for you. But then because they took the land away or we removed from those places that we, we lived, they took over. And they mined and they polluted the water that we were getting in those running water taps. So I don't know if it's a better way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if to, to say that is it is a better way to go bomb other people because they threaten you. So you have the atomic bombs going on, that mentality that we've all been living with now, whether or not we're going to exterminate ourselves. I don't think it's going to be by the bomb. I think it's because we don't know how to treat Earth anymore. That's, that's the ultimate. Mm -hmm. We're not ever going to save ourselves because salvation point mentality says it's got to come from someplace out there mm -hmm. and not within. So we can't have a savior or a UFO coming down to save us at the last minute because that's not going to happen because that implies that there will only be a chosen one which cannot be either wi within Lakota philosophy because we are all, we are responsible for each other. 
part of the, um, the, the Euro-American myth uh, is based on the fact that they had two things to enable them to control the native population. First of all, they had better armaments, weaponry, and whatnot that you had no access to. Uh, and, and secondly, they had the power of the word. It was that, that propaganda message that they were able to put out there, whether it was uh, calling themselves civilized and your people uh, barbarians or savages or heathens or whatever it happens to be. How was it that, that the, the, you have been able to, to maintain your language despite their efforts to indoctrinate you into the dominant culture, mm -hmm. and yet it seems like they still control the words, whether it's this indigenous culture or indigenous cultures around the world? In, in uh, about three years ago, I was uh, interviewing some Brazilian indigenous peoples mm -hmm. um, who came and had the regalia. Mm -hmm. um, and after the radio program, I took them to Wall Street. And we sit under George Washington, and they were, sp they were uh, speaking their language through Portuguese who were interpreted into English so I could understand. Right. And I asked them the question, so what do you think about all this? You know, most people think that this is civilization, this is... This is it. This is where man's gonna, you know, we should be thinking like Americans. And they had it interpreted, they thought about it for a while, and, and they put their hands out and they felt the ground and the earth, you know, some science fiction thing, really. And they were doing this, and they, they stopped and they talked to each other. And the one came forward and he said, he said, in my name, and, and then he spoke in, in his language, which he said, it's all temporary. This is all temporary. It's only going to be here for a, l a few more years, and it's all going to go, because our mother is going to correct it. Mm. So that's metaphorically, it's not going to be here, because if I say, okay, if I can be comparative in cultures, I am in a society of Mickey Mouse and McDonald's, and that's not a culture compared to Lakota. Mm -hmm. And we've been here before 10,000, before 20, 30, 40, 50, 100,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. We have stories and songs that we still sing to, th to this day in our ceremonies about the Unkche, the dinosaurs, living with them. Mm -hmm. So that's how old we say we are, not according to somebody else. We didn't come from the monkeys because that's somebody else's theory. We didn't come from the Bering Strait because that's their theory. They won't listen to our story where we had all land in the world on Mother Earth in one place, and we didn't behave amongst each other, and so she split us up. They won't believe that because there's no proof. Mm -hmm. So this is what we say. We have to tell the truth. We can't speak with forked tongue. No forked tongue. Right? But as, at some point, there was an arrival here yes, yes. Uh, by the Lakota people, according to your tradition, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, so uh, do you envision that, I mean, along the lines of some whacked out religion where it, it was spaceships that, that landed here and, and suddenly took up residence or is, is the tradition based on something more, uh, I guess, believable? We, we have in the original creation story, life, this planet, stars, was created by thought. But then we say, what was thought created for? Where was that coming from? Well, there was always thought. There was we can't understand it in our little brains where thought came from, but we know that thought created earth, thought created journey, thought created where we came from. In our sense, Diomni, and in the New Agers or whoever, scientists, astronomers, they say Pleiades, mm -hmm. that constellation. We have that story. Mm -hmm. We came down and we helped create Mother Earth. We had to respect and, and, and sort of make a Mother Earth. And so all of us peoples had that same way of thinking, your people, my people, as indigenous, mm -hmm. and I'm going to get off track a little bit here, but mm. you can correct me. I don't think we've stayed on a track oh, today. Oh, that's, no, okay. Took us in, so that's, that's fine. That's good. <laughs> but indigenous really means, um, in, in the etymology of, 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 uh, of Latin, means the poor people over there. So it's still describing us as those Indians on that reservation. Mm -hmm. But anyway, back to the, to the to creation story that we were created by our thoughts and not just humans, because we, we view life as nations. There is the ant nation, there is the flying nation. There are all these nations, the, the water nation, the swimming nations. These, these are nations. Mm -hmm. You think about that, they really are. They have guided their own original instructions. We're the only species on Earth that has, have not followed our original instructions to take care of each other and the Earth. 
we have gone outside and made ourselves disconnected from his process, his natural processes. So we aren't thinking naturally anymore like we, we could be. We tend to make a park over here, and that's not natural process thinking. That's, that's, that's rational thinking. We're gonna, these few blocks are a park, and we can go and play there because it's accessible. Mm -hmm. But when you come to a reservation, we don't have parks. Because it is the park. It is. Right. It is the park. A reservation is reserved for, and it, it's interesting too, r Native people only have the right to occupy where, where we live. And that's it. We really think about it. We really can't own land. Mm -hmm. And so the United States understood that. It's maybe the only minority in the United States that cannot legally own land. We have a right to occupy and hold a piece of paper and say, my family was given that in 1880 when the Dawes Act said, oh, we'll give the uh, parcels of land, 160 acres or so, to each family or head of fa family. Mm -hmm. And you can live on that, but you cannot own that. Earlier you mentioned uh, the quote-unquote father of our country. Uh, George Washington and uh, I guess a statue somewhere on Wall Street. Um, I guess I, I had read um, some positive things about him in terms of what he had to say about, about Native Americans way back when. Specifically, um, my understanding is that the first Thanksgiving, uh, according to some traditions, came because the Pequots in Connecticut were a slightly more warlike nation than the Wampanoags in Massachusetts and so the pilgrims were doing well with the Wampanoags sharing with them and whatnot but the Pequots wanted to fight and <laughs> then there was a, a large massacre of Pequot women and children and th then there continued to be massacres the first massacre the pilgrims said that's a great day of Thanksgiving and mm -hmm. then they had another massacre and they mm -hmm. said and this is another day of Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and my understanding is George Washington said well let's stop with the Thanksgivings let's just have one Mm. So I guess to try and put an end to the massacres, is that, uh, you know, what is your understanding of, of George Washington and some of the founding fathers in terms of their viewpoints toward well, Indians? Well, uh, yeah, uh, you know, sort of alluded to it last, uh, a few minutes ago where mm -hmm. we did, I did talk about the, the founding fathers is, you know, and I live in the state of South Dakota, right, and right. I grew up there, yep. and I see Mount Rushmore, mm -hmm. you know, the four founding fathers, one of them, anyway. Right. Yep. Jefferson, Washington, Lincoln, and uh, what's the other one? Roosevelt, right. modern day founding fathers. Right. Well, each of them we can name, we teach our children, it's like, okay, George Washington, he's the village burner. He ordered his army, Continental Congress army, to, to Continental Army to go and kill every Indian that is, has a village in along, up and along the Missouri or um, the uh, Mohawk River mm -hmm. and in the state of New York in this area, any right. native. Mm -hmm. And you put a bounty out on them and you give them, you know, the males, the bigger bounty, and if you get them, bring the skins here. And we go on and on and on. Jefferson also called, hunt them down like the wolf. He excluded native people as he was writing, uh, stealing the words from the Iroquois people. Teddy Roosevelt, nationalized over 52 million acres to make national parks and he took those away from reservations in the early part of the 19, uh, 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, who was left? Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation the same day he signed the, the, this country's largest mass execution of 38 Dakota men for supposedly stealing a cow that wandered on to their they're given reservation boundaries. And then the Dakota said, oh, we're sorry, we didn't know, it didn't have a brand and we thought it was on our own, we were hungry, we were starving at the time. Mm -hmm. So the, the native people gathered about 40 other skinny cattle as well mm -hmm. and gave it to the one farmer. That one farmer wanted justice. He says, I want the man, I don't want the cows. Mm -hmm. So all of them said, I am guilty. So the army came down and that's when that sort of war came along. And in the end, over 500 were indicted. So Lincoln signed, well, let's only hang 38 of them. So this, they all hung at the same time in Mankato, Minnesota. So these are, you know, the ideas that people are, are holding up as, well, forget about what we did to the Indians or the Native people. Mm -hmm. Let's hold what this freedom and caring for loving our, our fellow men is based upon. Mm -hmm. But let's not talk about the tree roots people. Let's talk about what we can change as far as gr grassroots movements is concerned. We're not concerned about having the graveyard still under the, the U.S. Capitol building with the Lene Lapi bones, the graveyard still on that, that hill of where the U.S. Capitol building. Let's not talk about that. Mm -hmm. This so was a burial mound sacred to, to the Indians. It's still there. 
It's proven. It's still there. Mm -hmm. So people want proof. Anything I say can be t picked up in a book. We're uh, we're beginning to run short of time. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, you know I, I I feel that we can learn a lot yeah. um, from from your yeah. culture. And I I mean just myself, I guess from the personal standpoint, I, one of the reasons that I moved into quote unquote farming country was like I wanted to bring my children back into contact with the earth and mm -hmm. and living things around them. And I, to tell you the truth, I've been an abject failure mm -hmm. because they, they want to maintain that connection to the, the culture, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's uh, iPods or TV sets or uh, video games or whatever it happens to be. I have the hardest time just getting them outside. I mean, is there a way that, that we can make this as, as accessible as it seems to be, you know, in the, as part of our conversation, mm -hmm. the, the whole relational notion mm -hmm. that yeah. we're all part of something bigger than ourselves? You know, it, it all through the, the program, it probably, people will probably view this, oh, well that, that's another one of those angry Indians, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we disagree so. with him. But the thing is, see, that to, to know technology as we are using it, we're using it in a proper manner because it's spoiling, it's spoiling us. So well, we, what do we do? We don't cut back on it. We view it differently. One thing that can change, I can give you all the information, but if I change your heart, I can have influence and change. But if I give you information, no one's going to change because mm -hmm. that's what I can and cannot have, have and have not. Mm -hmm. So when you come to the children and you view technology, I, am, I was taught to view this light here, this television, this, this thing, these microphones, mm -hmm. as having magic in them. And that any time the creator can take that magic away because you're misusing it. So we base this society, this culture, on a light switch. You turn it off. Mm. Whatever people think is culture is not going to work anymore. What do you have left? You have Earth. Mm -hmm. And guess who's still living, trying to live with Earth? Is those indigenous peoples all over the world, including the peoples that you come from, mm -hmm. the farmers in Kansas? Mm -hmm. They understand a lot more than those of us, those people who grew up only among humans and having domesticated animals, right, in mm -hmm. the city. In fact, there was a report a few months ago that there are more domesticated animals in the United States now than there are wild animals. So, you know, we have to start looking at those things mm -hmm. that you and I probably never thought would ever happen because of our privilege as Americans. So yeah. as, as the indigenous cultures become extinct, so become many of uh, the species on Earth, correct? I mean, there is that connection between those mm -hmm. two things. Mm -hmm. um, th just as sort of a, a, a last, a parting thought, I know you've talked about the, these stones, and I think I might have mentioned to you that Crazy Horse is alleged to have said to his people when he knew that he would be taking part in his last battle, mm -hmm. I will return to you as a black stone. Mm -hmm. Can you? connect us in some way to, the, to those stones in Brazil, I think you may have said, or South America, Central America? Well, the stones um, in Central America, and I'm not too sure which country, maybe Belize in that area, mm -hmm. but um, there are these, this, these valleys or this, this area where there are mass round circular stones. Um, in, the, in the 80s, I, I think it was, where this engineer who studied um, sonar, sound waves, sound waves and mm -hmm. Um, was among these people and he would go because he thought to find out more about the ethno ethno ethnography, the ethnography, study of music, right, yep, right. Um, he went to find out why these primitive people were doing these, these things that were amazing to him, like sitting and listening for hours from sun up to sun down without saying words, perfectly still in a meditative trance-like state. Because one young virgin would go hit a, a standing stone that was a pillar and mm -hmm. she would hit and he would sit down and he would listen. But this man who was in Western science who thought he knew everything what not, that he could not hear the sound. Mm -hmm. the next year he came back with all the equipment, all these microphones and he was able to record what that little girl was hitting. And it became a song. And that's the song that they told him that they were singing and he could hear it. And I, I, I won't mention, but there's a lot of modern day movies that are based on a lot of indigenous thinking processes. And see, to us, it's not, we told you so, mm. or give us credit for it. Right. Because we realize that because Americans are eating our ancestors and have been for centuries, this land has the food of our DNA of our ancestors, that the rest of America will finally get it. If not in this generation, you and I will see it. 
hopefully all of us will begin to, to hear that same sound. Yeah. And Tio Kassin, I thank you very much for thank joining you. me today. Thank you. And, uh, and one more version of MSL's Educational Forum. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us today.